In chapter 23, we will examine the digestive system. The digestive system consists of a muscular tube called the gastrointestinal tract or GI tract and a variety of accessory organs. As you can see in the figure, eating is one of the simple pleasures in life, but digesting even a simple apple requires the coordinated work of many organs, which we will examine in this unit. The functions of the digestive tract here you can see the major functions of the digestive organs that we will discuss. The mouth, the pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, accessory organs, and the large intestine. The gastrointestinal tract is the muscular tube through which food passes. And the GI tract is also known as the alimentary canal which begins with the mouth, continues through the oral, oral cavity, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, and large intestine, which opens to the exterior of the body through the anus. The accessory organs, as noted in the slide, are found along the length of the GI tract. There are several accessory structures that produce secretions containing water, enzymes, buffers, and other components that assist in preparing organic and inorganic nutrients for absorption. The primary accessory organs include the salivary glands, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. The organs of the GI tract have distinctive structural and functional characteristics, but all share an underlying pattern of histological uh, organization. There are four basic layers of the muscular tube, which you can see in the figure. The mucosa, which is the innermost lining containing the mucous membrane of epithelial tissue supported by a basement membrane and thin layer of muscle tissue. The epithelium of the mucosa varies according to location within the GI tract. Stratified squamous epithelium is found in the oral cavity, pharynx, and the upper portions of the esophagus and rectum. Simple columnar epithelium is found within the lower portions of the esophagus, the stomach, small intestine, and most of the large intestine, and also possesses numerous goblet cells, which are mucus-producing cells. The lamina propria is a basement membrane composed of areolar connective tissue and contains blood vessels, sensory nerve endings, lymphatic vessels, scattered areas of lymphoid tissue called pyrus patches and malt and mucus glands. The muscularis mucosa is two concentric layers of smooth muscle. The inner layer encircles the lumen, which is the circular layer, and the outer layer runs parallel to the long axis of the GI tract, the longitudinal layer. Contractions of the muscles within the muscularis mucosa create the folds that project from the internal surface of the GI tract, such as rugae, plicae circularis, and villi. The submucosa is a layer of dense, irregular connective tissue surrounding the mucosa and contains large blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, nerves, and in some regions, exocrine glands that secrete enzymes and buffers into the lumen of the GI tract. The muscularis externa is dominated by smooth muscle oriented in two layers, an inner circular layer and an outer longitudinal layer. These layers are essential in the mechanical processing of food and the propulsion of food 
through the GI tract. The serosa is along most portions of the organs and the peritoneal cavity. The muscularis externa is covered by a layer of visceral peritoneum called the serosa. There is no serosa covering the organs of the oral cavity, pharynx, or esophagus. Instead, a dense network of collagen fibers forms a sheath called the adventitia to anchor the organs to the surrounding tissues. In the abdominal cavity, the serosa often pulls away from the surface of the organs to create important membranes such as the mesenteries, greater omentum, and lesser omentum, which anchor the organs of the GI tract to the adjacent organs such as the kidneys, bladder, liver, and pancreas. Here you can see the modifications of the mucosa like the villi, which are folds in the small intestine, and they increase the surface area to facilitate the absorption of nutrients. Here you can see the smooth muscle tissue that's found um, around the organs in the digestive, reproductive, and respiratory tracts in the iris of the eye. And this slide shows the muscle contractions that occur within the smooth muscle. The dense bodies and intermediate filaments are networked through the sarcoplasm, which cause the muscle fiber to contract. Smooth muscle cells are relatively long and slender, ranging from 5 to 10 micrometers in diameter and 30 to 200 micrometers in length. Here's another view of the smooth muscle showing the innervation. And although actin and myosin filaments are utilized in the contraction of smooth muscle, they are arranged differently from that of skeletal and cardiac muscle. There's no sarcomeres or myofibrils, so there's no striations in smooth muscle. Furthermore, there are no T-tubules, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum forms a loose network throughout the sarcoplasm. Visceral smooth muscle cells have no direct contact with motor neurons, but are connected to each other via gap junctions. So whenever a contraction is stimulated, its electrical signal can spread from cell to cell. Pacesetter cells are present in areas where peristalsis, or rhythmic contraction, is necessary. And here you can see the different views of the smooth muscle cells. This slide shows the types of smooth muscle, both multi-unit and visceral smooth muscle. And you can see the visceral smooth muscle, as I just noted, lacks a contact with motor neurons. And so the way they are arranged and connected by gap junctions so that the contractions spread throughout the layer. The peritoneum is shown in this slide, which demonstrates the five major peritoneal folds, the greater omentum, the falciform ligament, the lesser omentum, mesentery, and mesocolon. The greater omentum is um, a peritoneal fold that lies superficial to the small intestine and transverse colon. It's the part of the body in the abdominal cavity or abdomen where fat deposition occurs. The falciform ligament anchors the liver to the anterior abdominal wall. The lesser omentum suspends the stomach from the inferior border of the liver. The mesentery is a vertical band of tissue anterior to the lumbar vertebrae and anchors the small intestine, and the mesocolon attaches two portions of the large intestine to the posterior abdominal wall. Now let's look at some digestive system processes and regulation. 
The digestive processes are ingestion, propulsion, mechanical digestion, chemical digestion, absorption, and defecation. Let's first look at peristalsis, which moves food through the digestive tract with alternating waves of smooth muscle contraction and relaxation. This allows for a one-way movement of food through the alimentary canal. Now let's look at some of the anatomy of the upper gastrointestinal tract, the mouth, pharynx, and esophagus. The mouth consists of the oral cavity, pharynx, and esophagus. The oral cavity produces a bolus of food. The anterior and lateral borders of the oral cavity is formed by the labia, cheeks, and vestibule. The superior cavity or boundary of the oral cavity is formed by the hard and soft palate, and the posterior boundary of the oral cavity is formed by the uvula and palatine tonsils. Digestion of food begins in the oral cavity. Food is broken down by the teeth and the saliva secretions help moisten the food, creating that bolus of food which we swallow into the um, esophagus. The mouth is shown here, which includes the lips, tongues, palate, gums, and teeth. The tongue is composed of skeletal muscle to manipulate the food, helps form words, and serves as a sensory organ for gustation or taste. Here you can see the anatomy of the tongue. The superior surface of the tongue is covered in epithelial projections called lingual papillae. The human tongue possesses three primary types of lingual papillae. Circumvallate papillae, which are very large round papillae shaped like the tip of a pencil eraser surrounded by deep epithelial folds. These are found on the posterior margin of the tongue in a V pattern. Each of these papillae possess about a hundred taste buds along the sides of each, each papilla. Fungiform papillae are mushroom-shaped papillae within shallow depressions scattered over the anterior two-thirds surface of the tongue. These typically possess only five taste buds located on the tops of each papilla. Phyloform papillae are hair-like papillae scattered all over the tongue which do not have taste buds associated with them. These are designed to create friction on the surface of the tongue. Many of the papillae contain taste receptors and specialized epithelial cells in sensory structures called taste buds. Although we have more than 10,000 taste buds when we are young, an adult possesses only about 5,000 taste buds, and by age 50, less than one-third of the taste buds still exist. The teeth are shown here. The teeth break food into smaller pieces through the process of mastication thereby increasing the surface area for chemical digestion to occur. There are two types of teeth, the primary dentition or deciduous teeth, which are also sometimes called milk teeth or baby teeth, are 20 teeth that erupt through the gums during embryonic development. The secondary dentition or permanent teeth fully replace the baby teeth by age 21. There are 32 permanent teeth in four general types. The incisors, which are blade-shaped teeth at the front of the mouth, used for cutting and nipping, possess a single root, 
we have eight total, four on top, four on bottom, and they are described as either central or lateral incisors. Canines are conical shaped with a sharp ridge line and pointed tip used for tearing and piercing. They also possess a single root and are sometimes called cuspids or eye teeth. We have four total of these, two on top and two on bottom. Premolars are flattened crowns with prominent ridges used for grinding, mashing, and crushing. They possess one or two roots. They're sometimes called bicuspids, and we have eight total, four on top, four on bottom, described as either first or second premolars. Molars are flattened crowns with prominent ridges used for grinding and crushing and typically possess three or more roots. We have 12 total, six on top, six on bottom, described as either first, second, or third molars. The third molars are sometimes called wisdom teeth. A typical tooth structure consists of a crown, which is the exposed part of the tooth that projects into the oral cavity, covered by enamel, over a highly mineralized bone-like material called dentin and a soft pulp within the pulp cavity. The neck is a narrow area that serves as the boundary between the crown and the root. The root is below the gingiva or gum and sits into the sockets of the jawbone called the alveoli to form numerous gumphysis joints covered by cementum and anchored by the periodontal ligament. The root holds the pulp cavity filled with pulp and extends down into the root canal and apical foramen. The pharynx is more commonly called the throat. The pharynx is divided into three regions. The nasopharynx, which is the superior portion of the pharynx located between the soft palate and the internal nares, lined with pseudostratified columnar epithelium and houses the pharyngeal tonsils. The oropharynx extends between the soft palate and the level of the hyoid bone. At the boundary between the nasopharynx and the oropharynx, the epithelial tissue changes from pseudostratified columnar to stratified squamous epithelium. This accommodates the movement of food through this region and protects against abrasion. The laryngopharynx includes a portion of the pharynx between the hyoid bone and the entrance to the larynx and the esophagus. Like the oropharynx, the laryngopharynx is lined with stratified squamous epithelium. The esophagus is a hollow muscular tube that functions to carry the bolus of food from the pharynx to the stomach, and it passes through an opening in the diaphragm called the esophageal hiatus. The basic structure of the esophagus is the upper third of the esophagus is composed of skeletal muscle for swallowing, while the lower two thirds is made entirely of smooth muscle and undergoes peristalsis. The upper portion of the esophagus is lined with stratified squamous epithelium, while the lower portion near the stomach is lined with simple columnar epithelium. The esophagus possesses many esophageal glands that produce mucus to lubricate the bolus as it moves to the stomach. The upper esophageal sphincter prevents the backflow of food into the oral cavity, while the cardiac sphincter also known as the gastroesophageal sphincter, or the lower esophageal sphincter, prevents backflow of stomach contents into the esophagus. The movement of food from the oral cavity into the pharynx and then into the esophagus is called swallowing and is shown here. This is divided into three phases, the buccal phase, the pharyngeal phase, and the esophageal phase. The voluntary and the two involuntary phases. 
the buccal phase is voluntary and the pharyngeal and esophageal phase are involuntary. Peristalsis moves food through the digestive tract with alternating waves of muscle contraction and relaxation. Now let's look at the lower gastrointestinal tract starting with the stomach. The stomach is a muscular, expandable, J-shaped organ that converts the bolus into chyme. The stomach is divided into four distinct regions. The cardiac region is the area where the esophagus empties into the stomach. The cardiac sphincter serves as the junction between the esophagus and stomach and prevents the backflow of stomach contents into the esophagus. The fundus is the dome-shaped portion at the top of the stomach and lies superior to the junction between the stomach and esophagus. The body is the largest region of the stomach and is the area between the fundus and the curve in the J. This region functions as a mixing bowl for ingested food and secretions from the stomach wall. The pyloric region forms the shape, sharp curve of the J. As mixing movements occur during digestion, the pylorus frequently changes shape terminates in a pyloric sphincter, which regulates the flow of chyme out of the stomach into the duodenum. You can also see here the greater curvature, which is the lateral surface of the stomach to which the greater omentum is attached. The greater omentum forms an enormous pouch that drapes down over the anterior surface of the small intestine. Adipose tissue in the greater omentum conforms to the shape of the surrounding organs, providing padding and protection across the abdomen. The lesser curvature is the medial surface of the stomach to which the lesser omentum is attached and stabilizes the position of the stomach and provides an access route for blood vessels to enter or leave the liver. Rugae are longitudinal folds within the lumen of the stomach which aid in the stretch and expandability of the stomach. As the stomach fills, the rugae gradually flatten until they almost disappear. The microscopic anatomy of the stomach is shown here. The mucosa of the stomach is simple columnar epithelium. The muscularis externa of the stomach is composed of a third inner layer of smooth muscle oriented diagonally to the axis of the stomach, the oblique layer. This extra layer provides the stomach with the ability to churn food for mixing with enzymes. Gastric pits are shallow depressions within the inner surface of the stomach. Each gastric pit communicates with several gastric glands that extend deep into the lamina propria. Gastric glands are located in the fundus and body and secrete most of the stomach juices used for gastric digestion. The gastric glands are dominated by several types of cells. Chief cells secrete the inactive enzyme pepsinogen, which then act, which when activated to form pepsin, can begin the process of protein digestion. In newborn infants, but not adults, the chief cells also secrete gastric lipase and renin, which are essential in the digestion of milk. Parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid for activating the pepsinogen, an intrinsic factor which is important in the absorption of vitamin B12. G cells are enteroendocrine cells that specialize and produce a variety of hormones and are important in the digestive process. Some of the hormones that are produced are gastrin, which increases stomach motility and churning, histamine, which stimulates the release of hydrochloric acid from parietal cells, endorphins, which is a natural opiate that gives a feeling of fullness, and somatostatin, which inhibits stomach motility and emptying. Now let's look at the small and large intestine.
The small intestine is specialized for the maximum absorption of nutrients and receives chyme from the stomach and serves as a site for the majority of digestion and absorption of nutrients. The small intestine performs peristalsis and segmentation. The gross anatomy of the small, a small intestine includes the duodenum, which is the upper region of the small intestine and receives chyme from the stomach as well as digestive enzymes from the pancreas and bile from the liver and gallbladder via the sphincter of odi. The duodenum contains large number of duodenal glands, sometimes called Brunner's glands, to secrete mucus. The duodenum and ileum are the middle portion and lower portion where continued chemical digestion and absorption occurs. The lower portion of the ileum contains Peyer's patches and drains into the large intestine at the ileocecal valve. Plicae circularis are deep permanent folds of the mucosa and submucosa orientated transverse to the axis and increase the surface area of the intestine. Most of these are located within the jejunum. Mesenteries are connective tissue extensions of the serosa that help to anchor the small intestine and hold the intestines into a tight mass. The microscopic anatomy of the intestine includes the intestinal villi, which are finger-like projections that sit over the surface of the plicae circularis and continue to greatly increase the surface area. Microvilli, which are tiny projections of the plasma membrane of each simple columnar cell, creating a fuzzy appearance called brush border cells. Mucus cells, which secrete mucins into the, onto the intestinal surface, and Peyer's patches, which are aggregated masses of lymphoid tissue with large numbers of lymphocyte cells. The phases of gastric secretion are shown here. Gastric secretion occurs in a cephalic, gastric, and intestinal phase. During each phase, secretions of gastric juice can be stimulated or inhibited. The cephalic phase is generally noted to be the phase that occurs before food has actually entered the stomach. This is when we're thinking, smelling about a food, and we can see some of the secretions and motility within the stomach begin to increase. The gastric phase, food has now entered the stomach, and we have distension and chemical products of food digestion that are stimulating secretion of gastric juices and motility. In the intestinal phase, the food contents are being digested and the stomach begins to empty. Segmentation separates chyme and then pushes it back together, mixing it and providing time for digestion and absorption. The large intestine is shown here. Here you can see the microscopic anatomy of the large intestine. Simple columnar epithelium is for absorption of water and electrolytes except in the rectum and anal canal where it is predominantly stratified squamous epithelium for protection against abrasion. No villi or plicae circularis or enzyme secreting cells are found here. Large numbers of goblet cells are found to produce mucus that lubricate the feces. And bacterial flora synthesize vitamin B and most of the vitamin K that the liver, um, I'm sorry, that is required, the liver requires to make blood clotting proteins. And here you can see the tenia coli, hostra, and some of the appendages. Let's look at some of the accessory organs of the alimentary canal. The accessory organs consist of the salivary glands, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. 
The salivary glands are exocrine glands that produce and secrete saliva via ducts connected to the oral cavity. Saliva is a mixture of water, mucins, buffers, lysozymes, and enzymes. Functions of the salivary gland include moistening and lubricating the mouth and food, cleansing food by defensins, lysozymes, and IgA antibodies, dissolving food chemicals for gustation, and initiating chemical digestion of complex carbohydrates by salivary amylase and fats by lingual lipase. There are three types of salivary glands. The parotid glands contain only serous cells for the production of salivary amylase and lysozymes, and they secrete into the parotid duct to the oral cavity. Sublingual glands contain mostly mucus cells and produce a watery mucin to act as a buffer and lubricant. Submandibular glands contain equal numbers of serous cells and mucus cells and therefore secrete a mixture of mucin and salivary amylase. The liver is the largest internal organ in the body and is responsible for the production of bile, an important emulsifier. The liver is primarily a metabolic organ but has only one digestive function. It filters and processes nutrient-rich blood of carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids from the intestine. The liver is also responsible for cholesterol metabolism and regulation of blood cholesterol levels. The liver also removes drugs and hormones from circulation and produces bile, which emulsifies fats in the small intestine. The microscopic anatomy of the liver includes the liver lobules, which form the structural and functional units of the liver. Each lobule consists of liver cells known as hepatocytes. Hepatocytes produce bile and process nutrients. Within the portal triad, located on the corners of the liver lobule, are three vessels, a hepatic portal vein and hepatic artery and a bile duct. The hepatic portal vein and hepatic artery bring nutrient-rich blood into the liver where it filters through the hepatocytes lining the liver sinusoidal cap capillaries that drain towards the central vein in the middle of each lobule. Cut for cells remove debris like bacteria and dead blood cells. Filtered blood enters the central vein which then drains into the hepatic vein that exits the liver and empties into the inferior vena cava. Meanwhile, bile produced by the hepatocytes travel opposite through the bile caniculi towards the portal triad, draining into bile ducts, which merge to form either the right or left hepatic ducts, exit the liver, and moves the bile to the gallbladder for storage. The gallbladder stores and concentrates bile until needed by the small intestine. The gallbladder is divided into three regions, the fundus, body, and neck. The release of CCK by the duodenum triggers dilation of the sphincter of odi and contraction of the gallbladder. This ejects bile into the duodenum through the duodenal ampulla. Now let's look at chemical digestion in a little more detail. As you've seen, digestion begins in the mouth and continues as food travels through the small intestine. Most absorption occurs in the small intestine. Here you can see the entire alimentary canal and the major functions of each of the segments of the alimentary canal that we just discussed. The absorption of water is shown here. Absorption is a complex process in which nutrients from digested food are harvested. And you can see food and drink provide a certain amount of water through our diet, digestive secretions, 
along with several um, gastric and intestinal secretions. And finally, the colon reabsorbs the remaining water so that food can be compacted in fecal material. This slide shows carbohydrate digestion and how carbohydrates are broken down into their monomers in a series of steps. Remember, carbohydrate digestion begins in the mouth with salivary amylase, but must continue on throughout the alimentary canal to break down carbohydrates into the individual monosaccharides so that the cells can transport them across the cell membrane. The digestion of carbohydrates, showing polysaccharides, examples of disaccharides, and the resulting monosaccharides, along with the enzymes that perform the digestion of several carbohydrates. The digestion of protein begins in the stomach and is completed in the small intestine. Remember, the stomach has a very acidic environment with a pH of around 2 and this is optimal for the enzymes that work on protein digestion. Proteins are successively also broken down into their smaller monomers which are the amino acid components and this allows for the cells again to transport the amino acids across the cell membrane for absorption. Fat or lipid absorption is shown here. Unlike amino acids and simple sugars, lipids are transformed as they are absorbed through epithelial cells. And finally, some of the disorders of digestion are shown on this slide. Dental caries is erosion in the enamel leading to cavities and tooth decay generally results from the action of bacteria that normally inhabit the mouth. Gingivitis is inflammation of the gums, which is usually caused by bacterial infection and can cause erosion of the gums. If not treated, this can lead to periodontal disease where the root becomes damaged and eventual tooth loss occurs. Halitosis is bad breath, which is usually caused by bacteria. Mumps are swollen parotid glands as a result of a virus infection. Hiatal hernia occurs when a portion of the stomach or sometimes a loop of the small intestine gets caught in the esophageal hiatus. Acid reflux is failure of the cardiac sphincter to prevent the backflow of stomach acids into the esophagus and is also called heartburn. As a chronic condition, it is called GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Peptic and duodenal ulcers are deterioration in the wall of the stomach or duodenum caused by um, a bacterial infection. Pancreatitis is inflammation of the pancreas from either drugs, toxins, bacterial or viral infections or blockages. If not treated, this can be fatal. Hepatitis is inflammation of the liver as a result of alcohol consumption, viral infection. Hepatitis A, B, and C are most common. Hepatitis can also result from drug use. Cirrhosis is chronic inflammation of the liver leading to scarring of the liver. Gallstones are highly concentrated cholesterol derivatives and bile. If the gallstones are so large they can, that they block the bile ducts and damage the wall of the gallbladder, it is called cholecystitis. Jaundice is accumulation of bilirubin in the skin as a result of blockage or liver disease. Enteritis is inflammation of the small intestine. Colitis is inflammation of the colon, often involving diarrhea or constipation. Hemorrhoids are varicose veins of the rectum and large intestines. Diarrhea is a watery stool caused by rapid movement of food through the digestive tract. Constipation is hard and difficult stool to, pa to pass, typically due to slow movement through the digestive tract or not enough fiber in the diet. 
Diverticulitis is inflamed herniation in the wall of the large intestine. And appendicitis is inflammation of the appendix as a result of blockage trapping infections, bacteria within the lumen. This concludes our look at the digestive system.